This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. So this week's talk, when I first read the title, I thought, well, cool, I know about computer literacy. I read a lot of programs. And I like Python because it's more readable. And I realized in my old age that reading programs was far more important than writing them, uh, despite what they told me earlier. It took a while to figure that out. But uh, Robert Lefkowitz is going to talk to us today about a different aspect of the problem, how computer literacy is actually a social issue and how it impacts the very, well, whether open source works. Does open source work if we don't have sort of universal literacy? And he also wanted me to mention his employer, Asurion, and that he juggles with clubs. So, thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. Uh, it's a good thing that you mentioned Python. Actually, this, uh, this talk, uh, Dennis uh, invited me here after he heard uh, a precursor of this talk at PyCon. So, so, this, uh, so this was inspired by Python and the readability of Python. Um, the talks change as I, as I write them and sometimes as I deliver them. Uh, I understand that uh, we can do questions or dialogue during the talk or wait till afterwards. Um, if we do it during, then I'll have to go off the rails because presentation software tends to be very linear in its exposition. And so if we, if we go off the rails, I won't be able to operate the machinery. But I'm, I'm willing to take that risk if, if, we, if we hit a place where, where questions or discussions would be, uh, would be interesting. So don't be shy. Um, it starts with free software as a political movement. And the notion that the, availabil the availability of the source code, which is sort of the foundation of the idea of free software, matters only to those who can read it. That is, if, if you Think about all of the other benefits that might accrue uh, from free software, but you're illiterate in software. There are other ways of achieving those ends. So, so the ability to read the software is sort of at the heart of it. One can say, uh, similarly to, to the notion of having a free press, right? the idea of a free press in a world where only 2% of the people can read. So what percent of the people can read source? And 2% is, might be a high estimate, could be a reasonable estimate. It's tough to get at because so we, we, we live in an age where uh, software is about business. And so when, when you, you can find out like how many programmers there are in there. You know, the Census Bureau says there are 600,000 people who list their occupation as programmers. But obviously, there are more people who know how to read code than people who are professional programmers. Just as there are more people who know how to read books than there are novelists or journalists. Uh, still, 2% would be 6 million uh, Americans or you know, 160 million people in the world. That's probably high. It may be low for the US, high for the world at large. So it seems like a reasonable number. How does that stack up when we think about literacy in the traditional sense? Well, in the Middle Ages, you know, it was kind of higher than that. And we think of that as kind of the, the nadir of literacy when, when the world was in this dark era where people weren't literate, couldn't read, books were scarce. Um, and when we go back to the ancient Athenians, we're, we're still at that roughly 5% range. So we're kind of at a historic low if we want to equate freedom of speech and freedom of software. So if we want freedom and we are ignorant, uh, 
we aspire to something that, according to Jefferson, never was and never will be. So this is a political statement, um, but lest we restrict this to politics, um, Bruce Sterling has this great book about the future of things, and he explores an idea called spines. Uh, the notion of spines being things that have more of a, of a digital existence than a physical existence. And that's kind of the next stage in evolution. Um, the idea of that evolution is, you know, in an agrarian society when you're making things, literacy isn't important. Then literacy becomes important as you move, move into more of a manufacturing culture and, and a mass culture. The literacy becomes important. And, and then in the future, according to this view, people are going to have to interact with digital things, digital objects. They're going to have to communicate with them in some wise. And we can roughly call the notion of communicating with digital mechanized things programming at some level. All literacy, I just came across this book halfway through it. Alex Wright is an information architect. Uh, my title now is information architect, so I have to learn what an information architect is. I wasn't an information architect. I, I asked for the title as kind of a joke. Um, and I got it, and now it's a, one of those clothes makes the man thing. <laughs> Turns out that information architects write a lot about literacy. Um, and writing in all cultures that we know of started out as craft literacy um, with specialists, and it was primarily used for business. In fact, the ones that we're familiar with, the Sumerians, Start out with cuneiform, and these were all about recording transactions. So the translation of this one is a transaction about 100 units of barley uh, by some measure of weight, and when it was going to be delivered and paid for, sort of a futures contract on barley. Um, so, so this you know roughly 3000 BC, and it's good. To, I got my start uh, financial services programming there, where we still pretty much writing software that does precisely this. This is mud-based. We were using sand-based silicon. But fundamentally, other than that substrate changing, we're doing pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> Transaction volumes, though, have increased. Um, and then after it's used for commerce, we evolve literature. Right? So the, the first poet was in Hedwana in 2025 BC, sort of like we say the first programmer was Ada Lovelace you know, in the 1860s. So you have this notion of we move, from, um, we move from commerce to literature. And that's where literacy becomes more and more important. And that's kind of what almost happened to us in the 80s. Right? So in the 80s, that was the idea. Um, Abelson and Sussman at MIT, in the introduction to their book, say that programs must be written for people to read. This was Andy's reference. Um, possibly grew up in the same culture. Um, and that sensibility is the fact that it's executable machines is interesting, but not really the point. Um, and that wasn't an East Coast phenomenon on the West Coast. Uh, Knuth had the same notion about literate programming, where a programmer should be, you know, should, programs should be considered works of literature, and a programmer is an essayist whose main concern is with exposition and style. Python, of course, got its start as a computer pro project to bring computer programming to everybody. The CP4E, Computer Programming for Everyone project, eventually turned into the Python project. That's the East Coast version. The West Coast version, of course, was Smalltalk, which had the same notion of making you know, anybody program. That was the 80s. And now, we don't do that anymore. It's no longer important. In fact, it's hard. Right? <clears throat> David Brin, you can tell I read a lot of science fiction authors, had an interesting article in Salon about why he's trying to teach his son how to program, and he can't. There's nowhere to go. You can't find programming. Every, com you know, every PC came with basic. Right? And everybody learned how to program in basic, and it doesn't anymore. So how do you learn how to program? We can't. We've, we've decided that literacy, 
defined as learning how to program is an learning how to write programs is an important. <clears throat> Bruce was was worried about um, learning how to write programs. But as I get more and more involved in this, there's, an, there's a great trilogy by Stephen Roger Fisher, which talks about lang the histories of language writing and reading. And he breaks out reading as a special set of technologies that are different than writing. And so a lot of the focus around teaching computer science is about teaching people how to write programs, not so much about how to read. And I suggest that if we need to know how to read programs in order to take advantage of in order for free software to succeed, then what do we do to make reading work? And lastly, because, because I don't want to come across as you know, thinking that this is just a political statement or a free software statement, Capers Jones studies MIS software activities. I spend my life in large IT institutions worrying about the cost of software. And when you break down MIS departments, there's a whole set of activities which I will call literary activities as related to software, where you ha it's all about reading stuff to understand what's going on as part of the process of producing code. So right away, you're kind of up around 15% of the money that you're spending is spending re you know, writing stuff down that people can read to understand what's going on. Um, and that's specifically called out. But we also know that 60 to 80 percent of all software coding is maintenance. And 60 to 80 percent of the effort that goes into maintenance is reading the old code to try to figure out what it was doing. You can do that, so the math is very simple. 50 percent plus or minus of the money that you're spending on coding is actually being spent on reading code. So we go back and take that 20%, break it out, and say, well, half that is a literary exercise. And now the literary exercise exceeds the, you know, the reading part exceeds the writing part in terms of cost. So reading software needs to get easier. What do we do to make reading software easier? Andy starts out by saying he reads code, he believes in it. But, but and I find when, when, when I talk to people from, from the Valley, that I get a different sensibility because, because their usual reaction is, well, everybody knows how to read code. <laughs> but in Nashville, where I work, the reaction is pretty much, everybody knows how to play the guitar, but not very many people know how to, how to read code. Um, so what did we do with literacy to make reading easier? And let's just do the same thing with code. So I always want to take a look back quickly on the great innovations of the past, sort of sampling. I mean, there's, there's more than this, but we only have you know, an hour. Um, as to the great innovations of reading, and everybody always starts with the printing press. In, uh, the, but printing press isn't about reading. The printing press is about, is about manufacturing books. So I, so I wanted to go back to other technologies that were specifically related to reading, reading technologies. And uh, one of the things that you can see from this chart is that uh, the whole notion that technology progress is accelerating is in fact visible. Right? You can see that it takes, it takes 950 years between the first and the second innovation. Right? And then time shortens only 700 years to the next big one. Then only 550 years maybe to the next big innovations that change the way reading work. And so if we sort of project that, we're thinking, well, you know, another 450 years, and that would bring us to like right about now, 550. Right? So, so we're right about that moment where something, something is due, right? And I know some of you are saying, oh, that's going to be the internet. Maybe it's the internet. Maybe it isn't. We don't know. But that's kind of what I want to talk about. So what is it that's happening today or that could happen today or that could happen next year that might make reading easier? And then in 2400, figuring that time con continues to accelerate when the next new innovation is due and somebody is standing here looking back 400 years ago as to you know, what that big innovation was at the turn of the millennium, uh, what would they be thinking? All right, so it's not about printing presses, and it's not about computers. You know, what Dijkstra said was computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. We're not talking about computers. We're talking about reading code. We're talking about literacy. And so where do we go to look? Where we go is rhetoric, the trivium. 
The trivium isn't taught very much anymore. Um, and my assertion is computer science ought to be taught like classical rhetoric. But we might want to start there, because that's what grew out of the, the, the tradition of reading. Now, I like the fact that the word trivial comes from trivium, because the trivium were the three things that an educated man had to know, and it was a university education. And then over time, people learned those things sooner and sooner. And then, and then we developed the quadrivium, which was the stuff you really needed for university education. The trivium was kind of like high school, and then it became like elementary school, and then it was kind of like everybody knew that stuff, so it was trivial. <clears throat> so the trivium is logic, grammar, and rhetoric. And how are how is rhetoric defined? Rhetoric is defined as the art of communicating through symbols ideas about reality. Isn't that computer science? Sort of? A special reality, is that what I heard? So the object-oriented guys are trying to model the real world with objects, right? <laughs> trying to argue that the best way to do, to do the design is to model the real reality. And um, programming is rhetoric. Now, I knew I hit upon something here, because if you Google for programming rhetoric, you don't get a lot of hits. <clears throat> so I started studying rhetoric, because I said rhetoric is just like computer science. And the more I looked at it, the eerier it became. So rhetoric has a development methodology. Right? How do you go about constructing an argument? Right? And there were steps in rhetoric. And it's the same steps going back to, to Aristotle. You know, they change every once in a while. Some people add one, some people delete one. But pretty much, it's the same thing. I spend my time in large corporate IT departments. If you're in a large corporate IT department, you have an enterprise architecture group. And the enterprise architecture group has to define the process by which software gets developed. And there are a couple of large models that people use. There's the Rational Unified Process, and then there's a the thing called the Microsoft Solutions Framework. And since we're in the Gates building, I thought I would talk about the Microsoft Solutions Framework, which we at Assurian have adopted as our framework methodology. And it talks about, you can, you can see sort of there's a circle. It goes around in a circle, and you start with envisioning and work through planning, developing, stabilizing, deploying, which then brings you back around. Um, and in fact, this sort of spawns these multiple sub things as you're going through the process. But everything is viewed in, in this sort of notion of this circle of, of activities that you have to do. And there are these five activities. That's very critical. And aside from the fact that this bears sort of an eerie resemblance to a lot of illuminated manuscripts and the use of colors and circles and the way the whole thing is laid out, the five tracks that you talk about actually map exactly onto the rhetoric. So Invencio is about figuring out what it is that you want, you know, what your point is that you want to make, gathering the facts. That's envisioning in the Microsoft Solutions framework. And Dispositio uh, is figuring out how you want to order those arguments, which is planning in the Microsoft Solutions Framework. It's about setting up the schedule, what order things get done. <clears throat> Elocutio is the selection of the particular words that are going to be used to make the points that you have decided you're going to make in that particular order that you're going to make them, which is building the talk. Memoria is the act of memorizing it so that you will be able to deliver it repeatably. And in the Microsoft Solutions Framework, that's called stabilizing. And lastly, you have to deliver the talk. You have to deploy your oratory. And that consists of the gestures that you use, the tone of voice, and the articulation, the projection, which is deployment. So if you start to think of programming as rhetoric, it turns out that at least in the corporate IT world, there's a very close match. The more you look, the more you find. All right, Cicero talks about the key success factors for parables being brevity, clarity, and plausibility. 
And if you go to any software engineering book, uh, they talk about brevity, clarity, and correctness, which is, you know, plausibility of some kind. Uh, the architecture of a speech, not the process by which it is developed, but the order in which it is, it is written or spoken, uh, follows very closely a, an ideal about how one would organize a function if one were writing a function. So I argue that the study of rhetoric is the study of computer science and that, and that we, would, we would do better to hearken back to our rhetorical roots because some of these things we've known for a long time. We don't have to reinvent that wheel. The Microsoft Solutions framework that I showed you was version 3 and 4, the two charts, because in, Microsoft, in the framework version 2, they didn't have stabilizer. See, but but, but uh, my suspicion is that, that Microsoft hired a rhetorician uh, who pointed out the lapse, and, and so they brought the solutions framework you know, sort of more aligned with, uh, with Cicero. <coughs> Now it is true that this notion that software needs to be readable, treating software as literature, the whole literate programming ideal, seems to have fallen by the wayside. People don't work on that anymore, as near as I can find. And so my thought was, it's because the idea of, of programming as communication between humans had gone. Right? That, you know, we had moved past that. It was, you know, it was sort of we tried, didn't work, the analogy failed. But the heat generated around this proposal convinced me that, that, I, that, that I was wrong. That, in fact, people had this idea. It was just being expressed differently. And the idea is motivated by uh, advice on Linux.org that code be in English with English comments for worldwide comprehension. That's our coding standard. In so a brief trip to Nicholas Osler's Empire of the World, word where he has this chart. And we observe that the definition of worldwide comprehension possibly has different meanings to different people. But if you're talking about number of people who might understand, that's not worldwide comprehension. Uh, nevertheless, that is the way it works. So if you, if, uh, if you go look for books on programming or web pages on programming, you know, they'll talk very much about vamos explicar cada linha de código. All right, we're going to explain every line of code. And here it is. Look, system prints hello world. It doesn't even say bom dia todo mundo. Right? It, it's, what's, that's wrong. <laughs> that's like totally wrong. <laughs> so which part is wrong? I apologize for this being written in French, but the English page that matches this page in Wikipedia doesn't have the Chinese glyphs. So where's the problem? What are we doing wrong? In programming, we have decided the solution is everybody speaks English. But not if you're a user. If you're a user, we make the effort to develop the technology that says, if I'm a Portuguese guy, I can see my menu items in Portuguese. And then when I surf the web, I will get my web pages in Portuguese. I don't have to learn English to use the computer or French. But if I want to write a little Python program, which I actually did, atualização is the Portuguese word for update. So if you want to write a little, you know, update my program module or update the data module, call it actualização. You can't do that. It's a syntax error because it's not ASCII English. <clears throat> now this is an easily fixable problem. All we have to do, if you look at any modern IDE, any word that you highlight goes and does some kind of database access and can bring up all kinds of stuff about it. It's a structured language. We know how the things fit together. We know, what, we know what it means. We know where it's stored. 
We know how many arguments it takes. So we could actually have the Portuguese version in there. We could use the same type of localization framework that we use for the code for the application user. And we could have the same internationalization, localization for the source code so that people speaking multiple languages could communicate more effectively. Programmers hate this idea. They hate it viciously. Well, English programmers hate this idea. And the argument is always, if you did that, it wouldn't work anyway because people would have to sort of communicate about what the program is doing. And if it was in all these different languages, then you wouldn't be able to make yourself understood. And it would just create this Tower of Babel. So we need to have just this one language, which kind of makes the point that writing software is all about communicating between people. And so why wouldn't we want to make it easier to communicate between people? By removing one of the barriers. So we don't want to do that, and we could do that. And I propose that one because that's the easy one to do. And here's the other interesting thing, that we object to the notion that a person might have to deal with multiple languages here. And we should, the solution is, let's just get everybody in the world to program in English. But it's OK to have multiple programming languages if you're writing, if they're not human languages, right? <clears throat> yeah, if you're an Emacs user, then you'd uh, care about less. So, so people care. It's about communication. It's about making things easier to read. And the most recent innovation that made things really easy to read was spaces between words. In which case? You don't use spaces between words. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do use spaces between words, Somewhere. but you have, you have a mechanism for combining multiple words into larger words, which you still want spaces in between. Uh, spaces between words is actually well understood because we know who did it. Right? Spaces between words were invented by a particular guy. And the particular guy was hired by Charlemagne because Charlemagne was concerned that uh, it was getting harder and harder to read. And the reason it was getting harder and harder to read was because people were copying manuscripts and the, the fonts were diverging and the texts were diverging. Uh, and one of the key reasons, incidentally, which is that, 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 that things were getting harder to read and, and, and the various scriptoria, uh, uh, scriptoria were diverging is because it had become standard practice to hire illiterate people to be copyists. <laughs> and the reason you had to hire an illiterate person to be a copyist was because a literate person doing the copying would correct what they perceived as logical errors in the arguments, would tune up the wording, would maybe insert a few points that the original author had missed, you see. So in order to protect the valuable intellectual property associated with that, if you had somebody who was just copying these glyphs that they had no idea what it meant, you would get a they thought, a more accurate rendition. And, and at some level, this was true. But you got drift over the years. You didn't have any kind of error correcting codes at that point because it was all just curly cues on the page. So Charlemagne wanted to revamp that system and other things and uh, sort of increase the, the general level of literacy. And this sparked what's known as the Carolingian Renaissance. And he hired Alcuin of York. Uh, the English and the Irish were sort of the big, the big, like the programmers of their day. Uh, producers of books and the inventors of the illustrated manuscript. And he developed the, the writing system that we still use today. It was uh, from the Carolingian minuscule, some samples of which are here. And one of the, hard to see, but one of the key things about it is that made it visually much more arresting is that aside from standard height ascenders and descenders, because he standardized those heights, he invented this notion of putting a little space between the words. And that made reading not a specialist thing. Because words had a shape. They had standard A and D centers. You could sort of look at a word. You knew where it started and ended. You didn't have to puzzle it out. And prior to that, reading involved deciphering this code for which it was helpful to have pictures on the page to remind you what it was that it was about, you know, sort of like an architecture diagram so you could follow along. And then once you'd puzzled it out, then you could memorize it, then you could stand up sort of referring to it every once in a while. You could 
deliver it. So it was really, writing was a memory aid. But this spaces between words made it possible to actually read to yourself, read with, you know, sort of on the fly, real to just in time reading for the first time. And then once they, now, and since writing was about reading, the reason you wrote things down was to be able to read it, and one of the main reasons you had to read it was because you had to read it to people who didn't know how to read. You also wanted some cues for when to take a breath, when you know, the end of the thought was, and so forth. So they also, once they hit upon this notion, like the, the creativity ran berserk, they invented punctuation. <laughs> we have punctuation today. Not very much of it in ASCII, by the way. And all of these punctuations that are available to us, um, we don't use in programming. Because we use ASCII in English. So we could change programming languages, take advantage of that. Now, I'm particularly sensitive to this issue because I started out as an APL program. <laughs> <laughs> and as an AP, uh, APL is the language of the future. <laughs> and always will be. <coughs> and always will be. <laughs> you got that part right. <clears throat> so here's the Wikipedia page for APL. We have all these weird glyphs that we use because it actually explicates it more easily than if you have to restrict yourself to English. I saved my old uh, type ball, by the way. Mm -hmm. so, so nowadays it's easy. We have soft fonts. We could do that. It wouldn't be hard. The argument was that what killed APL was you had to have this special type ball that you put on your selectric terminal in order to be able to read or write your code, and that that was the failure. But now we've gotten beyond that. Right? We could do it again, but it's a lost art. And we use notations for all kinds of other things that we expect people to be able to pick up, and it's not that hard, and we do typesetting systems for that. So why wouldn't we use it in programming? Well, we do in some places, but we actually use it more in English. So if you look at this little piece of a Mathematica notebook, right, we start out right there. The Fibonacci string is a binary omega word. Right? So in the description, in the text, in the thing that we sort of read as literate people, eh, we're okay using Greek characters and symbols and italics and all that kind of stuff. And then we get down to the code, and the code is ASCII. But not in Mathematica always, because you have the option in very few programming environments To use that non-ASCII stuff, like that weird line and placement on the page and Greek letters that mean stuff that are actually more meaningful, that we would have used and we do use. right? So we use it in the text over there and like, oh, we could use it in the program too. So all we would have to do is change programs so that you could do this kind of stuff. And we have the technology. We know how to do that kind of thing. And it would make program reading a whole lot easier. The innovation before that, which we should aspire to in computer science, is the codex, which we call now the book. The idea of instead of using a scroll, instead of sequential access books, that you would have random access where you would have pages that you could turn. Now, the argument is that Julius Caesar actually invented it and he used it, but nobody knows really who invented the codex. So we pay less attention to that one. Codex is about packaging. It's about a form that you can use to store this thing and carry it around and, and dip into it more readily. And the Mathematica notebook suggests that ideal. Because the question is, how many files do you need to look at to understand the program? Right? How do we deliver source code? We deliver it in a bunch of .c files, .py files that are not organized in any logical way. Right? There's no ordering implied. So how do you create some kind of narrative structure? How do you understand what it is that's going on in your program? There's no way of doing it. So why isn't it just like a big document? I don't know, like a book with chapters and sections, and tables of contents, and all those things that we developed in the 1450s. The 1500s, you know, Gutenberg gets the credit because, oh, we invented the printing press, but, you know, somebody invented the table of contents. <clears throat> and that helps organize it. 
So Mathematica has this notion of a notebook where you mix your executable code and your non-executable code, this idea of literate programming that, that Knuth had way back when in the days when everything had to be ASCII. But we don't have to be ASCII anymore. So we can mix that stuff together. And the last innovation that I want to talk about, which we could do something about in programming, which we don't, but we could, is vowels. Vowels were invented in approximately 850 BC. Now, people have been writing for thousands of years before that, but all writing systems were syllabic systems. Right? So they started with pictures, hieroglyphics, which denoted words, and you had a bunch of pictures for words. Then you got to another level of abstra abstraction where it stood for the sound that the word made. But for some reason, it either stood for the syllable that the sound made, or it stood for the consonant that the sound made. And if it stood for the syllable, then over time, you sort of dropped the vowel, and it just stood for the consonant. And therefore, when you wrote stuff down, you had the consonants, and the vowels had to be implied. If you think about Hebrew, it's the way it works. And now we sort of added little dots and whatever to tell. But for reasons that I guess we don't have time to go into, the Greeks wound up picking their vowel sounds and associating them with letters from the alphabet that they had borrowed from the Phoenicians. And then it made it possible to actually capture what people were saying, which meant that you could have poetry because then you could sort of you could capture the sonority of the, of the human voice. And you could have oratory and rhetoric. And those are the people who invented oratory and rhetoric. And that's when they developed it. And we believe it's because they had vowels that they could write down. So it wasn't a code that you had to puzzle out. So if we stop thinking about it, so if you think about the easy sentence, right, which we know how to read now because reading is easy. We teach everybody how to do it. It's not that hard. <clears throat> and then if we take out the spaces and the punctuation, it's a little harder, but you can sort of get by. Or you could take out the vowels, and everybody knows that you could sort of mostly get by with that. And so you have to puzzle it out. But of course, when you take all of them out, which is where we were way back then, then it becomes very cryptic indeed. And this is where we are in the state of the art computer programming. That's why we can't teach people how to program. Because you can't speak it out. You can't, you can't read it. It's too hard. That's why the illustrated manuscripts, to give you those cheat sheets. That's why we have architecture diagrams, to give us those cheat sheets. You can't read the code and figure out what's going on unless you have all this supplementary stuff. And the reason we were writing stuff down was so that we could deliver it as oratory. And we studied hand gestures as part of that whole delivery process. So the Kirologia and the Kironomia written in the 1650s sort of explain 75 different hand gestures and what each one means. I'm not using them all here today, but <laughs> but if I, if, I, if I were, my talk would be that much more engaging. So the question is, how do you read code out loud? And nobody has designed a programming language that's meant to be read out loud. But all written languages were designed to capture things that people were saying out loud and write them down so that they could then be said back out loud again someplace else. Now, this is just my own personal background, but it's easier to read APL out loud than it is to read C out loud or Java out loud. All right. Sorry? Ah, so you take that top line, right, which sorts the word list, right, based on the number of characters in the word. Because you look at it, and what you're saying is, what I want to do is I want to take x in the order sorted by the sum of the non-blank letters. That's how, it, you know, that's how you read it in APL. <laughs> right? It is what it says. Now, you don't understand the punctuation. Right? And so I grant you that. But just like when you see like a sigma in a mathematical equation, how are you supposed to know that that's summation? Well, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're literate. You're educated. Right? You, you had that in elementary school. It's trivial. Right? Well, it's trivial after 
800 years of teaching it at the university level, then the high school level, then the elementary school level, then it becomes trivial. So when we say, oh, programming is hard, right? well, it's hard the same way that reading is hard. And how do you say it out loud? But when you're trying to read, when you're trying to read Java or C, have you ever done that? Right? You actually, most people I know, and of course I'm in the valley now, so, so this may be different, pronounce all the punctuation marks. You know, system dot out dot print ln, open paren, you know, you, you, you have that kind of a conversation. Now why, why well, we've agreed, we've agreed that programming is all about communicating ideas between people. That's why you want to have everybody do it in English, right? Well, if they're all doing it in English, and they're not all in the same room, or even if they are all in the same room and they want to argue about the code, or they're not in the same room and they want to argue over the telephone about the code, or they want to stand up and talk about the code, how do they say it out loud? How can you use programming as a way to communicate between people if you can't pronounce it? So, so we need to be able to pronounce things. So if you combine all of these things, that's what will make free software successful. Free software will be successful when people can talk it. <clears throat> now the structure of a rhetorical argument in the classical tradition requires that after you make your point, which is called the confirmation, you have to do something called the confutation, in which you argue that you're wrong. So. This is the confutation. I'm sorry. I think I might be wrong. Now, there are many reasons that I might be wrong. So let me explain the reasons that I've thought of about why I might be wrong. So the first reason that I might be wrong is that everything I know is wrong. Well, everything you know is wrong. As a case in point, as an example of everything we know being wrong, I started out very early on by asserting that Gutenberg invented the printing invented movable type. And we all know that this is not true. The Koreans invented movable type. Well, the Chinese invented movable type, but they didn't do anything with it. But the Koreans then did something with movable type. And they say, well, but it wasn't metal movable type. Not true. In 1403, they, had, they were operating movable metal type printing presses in Korea, which went on for a while. But it didn't catch on. It didn't catch on for economic reasons. It didn't catch on for social reasons. It didn't catch on because people didn't read the stuff that they were printing for a variety of reasons. One, one of the arguments actually is, that although Gutenberg gets the credit, there was this run-up to literacy before Gutenberg uh, and, and book publication and book dissemination. And what made that possible was that paper became cheaper. Because they weren't using parchment, they were using paper. And the paper was rag paper. And the reason the price kept coming down is because it had become the fashion to wear cotton underwear. And so a lot of people wore cotton underwear, and the cotton underwear wore out, and then you had these cotton rags, and then they did, got rid of the cotton rags cheap, and that was a great source for making paper, so the price of paper came down, so literacy increased. So it was really the result of fashion that drove a large part of the medieval upswing in literacy. So the problem we have is all of these analogies that we're making to history and what happened in history could be wrong because, because we have the wrong history, a very ethnocentric view of the history, and so if we sort of corrected it for other cultures, then the whole argument falls apart because, because that's actually not how it worked in other cultures. The other reason I could be wrong is because I've tried to argue that literacy is related to, uh, computer programming literacy is related to, to reading literacy, although currently it's a craft because all writing starts as a craft, but then eventually it evolves into literature. On the other hand, uh, the linguist Walter Ong makes the point that writing is practiced by craftsmen like a stonemason or a shipwright. And possibly the analogy is flawed in that writing a computer program is like being a stonemason or a shipwright. And it will remain so as stonemasonry and shipwrightry has remained thus throughout the millennia. And it doesn't evolve into anything. So that could be the case that making chicken scratchings on silicon to record business transactions will remain the recording of business transactions and there's no literature there. The other reason that this could never work is because Piaget has kind of a depressing conclusion 
So he looked at the development of people's reasoning capabilities, and he divided them into a couple of different developmental stages, pre-operational, concrete, and formal. And the formal stage, the most advanced stage according to Piaget, is that stage at which people can manipulate abstract concepts, abstract symbols, sort of divorced from their concrete physical representations. So there's a stage, and everybody knows about the, the, uh, the experiments with pouring water from tube into you know, tube. That's a sort of a concrete stage where you reason about the stuff that you can actually see in front of you. And then there's this transition to abstract reasoning. The abstract reasoning, this is not a very good chart, is the green and the blue. 30%, 30, 35, people have done these studies, experiments over and over again, of adolescents, of adults, get to the abstract reasoning stage. 70% never do. And programming is the epitome of the abstract reasoning art, and therefore, if most people can't do it, then most people won't do it. Now, there's two ways of interpreting this. One is that's just the human condition. It's a genetic thing. Some people have it and some people don't. You're born knowing how to dereference pointers or not. <laughs> right? Like you either get it or you don't. Joel Spolsky makes that argument in one of his, one of his essays where he talks about, you know, you, you can't teach that to somebody. They either get it or they don't. Well, maybe you can't teach it to them when they're 27. But maybe you can teach it to them when they're five. Maybe there's something you can do when they're five or six or seven. And this is an argument that goes back to antiquity. Because they were having that argument about learning, teaching people how to read. Right? So the big debate in Quintilian's time, and Quintilian was a great sort of teacher of rhetoric, was that you know, there was a whole group of people who thought that children shouldn't be taught how to read until they were seven years old. But he didn't see any reason why they shouldn't start before they were three. So if we were teaching three-year-olds how to program, or we were focused on figuring out what it was that we would have to teach three-year-olds so that by the time they got old enough to get to the abstract stage, more than 30% of them would get up across the line, maybe then we would be able to teach reading. So, so the problem may be deeper. We may not be able to successfully develop a free software culture because we're doing the wrong things when kids are three. And maybe we don't want to change what we, how we raise our children, and so that's why this will never work. Or maybe it's biological. The other reason why this is a silly idea is because it has always been thus. So in the 1300s in Florence, 10,000 children were learning how to read. They had academies. Now you work it out. It turns out there were 80,000 people in Florence in the third, you know, around, around that time. If you look at the census, average of 1.83 children per family, maybe 40,000 kids. That's a 25% rate. But only a few of them were learning the grammar and the logic part. Well, we can say the logic part is kind of what we would might call, I don't know, mathematics, computer science. Right, that type of abstract reasoning. So if for close to a thousand years we've had the distinction between reading and logicking, then maybe for the next thousand years we're going to have that distinction. That could be the case. The other reason this is not going to be ever work is because there's no literature. There's no canon. There's no Shakespeare or Dickens of programming. Right? Nobody sits down and curls up with a computer text. Because, well, this is not actually literature, right? Because this is written in English, right? This is kind of not really literature that's like programming literature to read a program. This is more like reading about writing, right? So reading Fowler's usage is, is not quite the same as reading Dickens. It talks about how to write, but it doesn't, it's not reading, right, making that distinction again. And reading, oh, I'll make a point later. Um, and lastly, which was the point I think Andy made before the talk, is the notion that everybody doesn't need to be literate in order to have a literate society. You could have professional literates, right, scribes, 
So the society can be based on Hammurabi's rules. Hammurabi's rules are carved into some big, huge plaque in the town square. If you ever care what they are, you hire a professional. You say, what does that say? And he tells you. And that, in fact, is one of the things that drove the Carolingian re uh, Renaissance, is because Charlemagne, not only did he bring Alcuin in to improve the, uh, the quality of the writing, but he made it illegal for priests to read secular works. They could only read the Bible or liturgical bowls. But if you wanted to do a business commercial transaction, you had to hire a lay scribe, which created a whole business around reading and writing, <laughs> which is why later on the printing press caught on 600 years later. Maybe. I could be wrong about that. <clears throat> and lastly, Everybody knows the picture's worth a thousand words. So people don't need to learn how to read because they could just get by with pictures. And so Pope Gregory the Great made this observation in 600 AD that pictures are the equivalent of reading for the simple folk. Because you can get across what they need to know that way. <clears throat> and 600 years later at the Synod of Arras, what the simple people cannot grasp through reading the scriptures can be learned by means of contemplating the pictures. Right? So mostly you can get by without being literate. Right? We have podcasting, we have TV, we have movies. Like nobody needs to learn how to read anymore. We're past that. And we're past it with literature and we're past it with programming. So that could be true. And I think the final reason why this isn't going to work is because the most popular book in Europe for the 500 years leading up, well, maybe 400, years leading up to the invention of the printing press was, of course, the Bible. But that's because that was kind of mandated by law. So it doesn't count. So what was the most popular book that after the Bible? And it was the bestiary. Every town had the bestiary. And the reason you had a bestiary is because, A, had a lot of pictures. right? So you'd have the picture of the unicorn. And, so, and people knew the story. So you just needed the book to remind you of the stories, and the stories were passed down from father to son and mother to daughter. Right? And it was, it, was mo it was how you taught your culture, it was morality and ethics. Right? So to the extent that there was a culture, it was passed down by talking about the stories in this book, and you could gather around the book, and every town and village in Europe had a bestiary. In fact, mass production of books began about 100 years before Gutenberg because they needed to mass produce bestiary. So there were sort of manual mass production techniques that people were developing. And when the printing press came, of course, then they took over. But, but there was this slow swell. So what, why is it that people read? Why is it that the Koreans were publishing? And nobody wanted to read that stuff, whatever it was that they were publishing. But they, they took off in, the, in Europe. And the argument is that people read not for information so much as for culture and myths and moral lessons emotional content, the stuff that parents pass on to their children. And of course, parents are never going to pass on stuff like this to their kids through code. Maybe. So we can just define computer literacy, redefine computer literacy to mean what they say it means on the computer literacy homepage. There is a computer literacy homepage. Google for computer literacy, and there it is. Computer literacy and computer literacy, of course, generally refers to the ability to use applications rather than to program, according to the computer literacy page. So those people are called power users, and that's what computer literacy is. Now, I choose not to define it that way. So I'm willing to be wrong in all of these ways. So we can't teach people how to write programs because we don't know how to teach them how to read programs. And the failing is not in our educational system. The failing is in the technology. It is too immature. We haven't invented the equivalent of spaces between words that makes it easy to read, or punctuation, or something like that. Computer programs should be narrative. It should tell a story that everybody would want to read. There should exist one. Maybe we can't get there from here because we don't have a bestiary. What's the program everybody would want to read? Right? I think it's the source code to World of Warcraft. 
that's just me. <clears throat> so the great innovations, vowels, books, spaces. And we agreed printing press, of course, is wrong, shouldn't be there. We'll put something else in there. Uh, italics, maybe. The octavio, the idea that instead of a book being a this big, which was folio size, so that we chained down because it was a valuable asset of the company, of you know, the church or the village, so you would have to nail it down, that you could fold it into eight pieces so you'd have something that you could carry with you. Sort of like a Dina bookish concept, you know, like just take the book with you. So we'll call that the reading innovation that happened around that time. And I'm hoping that when we look back from the 2400, as we're on the cusp of the next, uh, brink of the next thing that happens, um, we say, you know, what happened at the end of the 20th century was that literacy and numeracy were merged because we figured out how to provide narrative structure to mathematics. Algorithms had always been explained as language as, and where you sort of gave rough instructions to people going all the way back to Euclid, like how do you do this? You explained it in words and that, and that this new innovation, right, which revolutionized mathematics and literacy, was how do you take a sequence of steps and express it in some way that was a better way of expressing it than people had figured out heretofore. And that, rather than the internet, was the great contribution of the 20th century to the development of literacy. I was told to leave time for questions. I left time for questions. Dictionary seems pretty important. The dictionary? Because it allows you to read and learn new things without having to go to a better reader to understand. Yes. A dictionary is important. Who invented the dictionary? Noel Webster gets credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, coming out in 1750, I think. Right, yeah, so, so fairly late in the development. <laughs> Literacy rates were already pretty high by the time we get to the 1750s. Um, so it, it, it may have brought us the rest of the way there. But I, I, so what would, be, what would the analog to dictionaries be in, in, in computer science? I don't know about the analog to dictionaries, but in narratives, if you by some of the uh, programming tools that do allow you to traverse the program in many different ways, sort of in a goal-directed fashion. So it's sort of an index according to whatever your needs are. Not that they ever work completely, but. Um, OK, so that's you know, ex post facto, right? So you, you have this sort of mass of clay tablets lying around on the ground and you're saying like, I can't make sense of this. It's like, oh, well, we'll go over here and we'll build you a map so you know which clay tablets to pick up in what order. And, and so that's a solution to the problem. But if you sort of step back, sort of I think, what's the root cause of that problem? The root cause of that problem is, well, I, I haven't, haven't thought of books. I haven't thought of chapters. I haven't thought of textual cues that, that are meaningful, right? I haven't thought of how to convey emotional nuance you know, on the page. I, you know. So th there's a whole bunch of stuff, tricks that have evolved over the centuries. Right? So I'm not saying this is an easy problem. Right? I don't expect that you know, we'll come out with, with, uh, with a solution to literacy. But I do think that the reason free software got turned into enterprise, you know, got turned into commercial software, and the distinctions blurred so rapidly is because it is only of interest. Right? <clears throat> Free software is only of interest to people who know how to read programs. And the people who know how to read programs, by and large, are professional programmers who get paid for reading programs. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of a small community of professionals. 
it doesn't become a wider social issue unless wider groups of people can participate in the discussion. There's two aspects of sort of the social part of free software. One is you know everybody being able to read it for whatever reason, and the other is just having it there so that the nominal experts can refer to it and use it in dealing with each other and the rest of the world. Yes, so, that, so, so, so that's the argument that says um, a model like the medieval model where you have professional scribes um, who will interpret the word for you right, is, is a workable model. Now, I think what history shows is that in that model, you don't get a lot of agitation for freedom of the press. Because the presses are owned by the people who read them, you know, the stuff to you, roughly. Right? The people who make, manufacture the books are the only people who know how to read them. Or, in this case, the people who manufacture them don't even know how to read them. Right? Um, so I think there's a... <clears throat> so let me just back up to, a, to, a, to an observation that my, that my wife made, who... Um, and just, just to set some context here, um, uh, when, when I met my wife, she instituted a rule that children under the age of 14 were not allowed to, to use computers. Um, not because she's a lot of, just, you know, she thought, you know, they're a great idea, but it's like wine, you know, it's, just, it's not for kids. And she's never programmed a computer, as far as I know, so, so she always brings a fresh insight into, into some of these things. And we were talking about jars. It turned out that uh, people who made jars, jams and peanut butter and stuff like that, found that arthritic patients or elderly patients were having trouble opening the jars. So they studied like what made a jar hard to open. They discovered that if they made wider mouth jars, they were easier to open. So they started making special wide mouth jars for people who had difficulty with their hands. These were the easy open jars, and they had the hard open jars. And then at some point in the evolution of that whole process, somebody said, wait a minute, if it's easier for people who have trouble to open jars to open, it's also easier for everybody else to open the jar. So why do we want to manufacture like special hard to open jars? Right? Why don't we just like make easy to open jars? So the argument that I would make is yes, professionals who've dedicated their lives to studying, you know, software can puzzle out the, Byzant the Byzantine codes that, you know, in the way that we currently do it. But we've agreed that software is kind of about communicating between people. We've identified a number of ways in which it could be made substantially easier. Now, it could be made substantially easier for professionals. And, it could, and whatever those things are that would make it substantially easier for professionals to say code out loud to each other, to decipher code, to understand the narrative structure of the whole program that they were doing, to not have to have separate requirements from code because you could just read the code and figure out what the require, you know, what, what it was that it was supposed to be doing. That all of those things, that if we had a more expansive view about how programming languages ought to be designed and implemented and deployed, if we did that, it would make life easier for all of those professionals. It would also make life easier for any amateur who might choose to do that. And, but then we separate that, and we might not choose to do that, but having done that, it might, it might remove the barrier, and then people like the burghers in Florence in the, in the 1300s might start clamoring for their children to learn that stuff too, because it was so useful. Right, so if we believe it's useful, we believe it should be easier, then we, you know, we, could, we could start making it easier in these wises. Right? Why are we manufacturing these special hard-to-make, you know, hard-to-open <laughs> jars, just because we don't have arthritis? <clears throat> yes, sir. So would we get to someday when you read Johnny or Mary in bedtime code? Um, <laughs> could be. Well, you see, we program games, right? So I think games, games are in there somewhere. I'm not quite sure how that works. But again, with, we, uh, I played a video game with my wife once. And the part that she liked the best was there was this part where you had this puzzle, and the puzzle was there was this old machine, and then you had to figure out how to get the machine to do something. So there was this set of graphical instructions. It was sort of like you had to construct this graphical program in order to do that, and, and that was kind of very interesting, and you know, we didn't think of it as programming, but in fact it was communicating ideas about reality through symbols. 
that we had to sequence in a particular way, and you know, it was a program. So, so that kind of thing is stuff that we might want to do with our children, right? Because we don't teach them how to do that kind of stuff. Right? We typically programs for children take existing, you know, educational content and sort of help you learn it, you know, using a computer. But but we're not sort of changing the way we think about what kinds of things ought to be learning. So so it might be something like that. But you're right. I, I, I struggle with the this this thing falls down on the so so is there any is there any moral uh, dimension or you know stories that you might want to tell your children or object lessons that, that, that would involve understanding the algorithm. I can't think of one, but then again, you know, the spaces between words, we look back at it now and we say, like, how hard is that really to think of, right? And yet, people had been writing for close to 4,000 years and nobody had thought of it. Like, in any culture that we can find, like, they all smushed everything together. Nobody had spaces between words. Right? Alice. Well, I wish Knuth were here. <laughs> he uses, no, he uses the 2% figure as well, too. And I've had some wonderful discussions with him about some of this. But I'll tell you where I think your argument largely falls down. It's where you rejected, as you did with Dijkstra, that this is not about computers. The answer is, it is about computers. And I heard, I've heard these various arguments over the course of the past mm -hmm. week or so. And my favorite, one of my favorite, and it's totally totalitarian in certain respects, quote comes from Dave Clark at MIT, is we reject kings and democracy in favor of, you know, it's a longer, in favor of rough consensus and working code. And for instance, the Europeans, when they attempted to come up with a network protocol called X25, mm -hmm. they didn't understand this. Right. And they never had anything really to show for it. I mean, small portions of X25 exist, but for the most part, they're running TCP. And it's the same thing with, with regard to computers as well, too. You gotta have some, you're trying to convey not only to people, but to an, an inert box in some way mm -hmm. to get it to do something interesting. Now, it turns out, I, it turns out I read uh, Alex Wright's book, and it's an interesting book. Now, I've actually written like eight things down that I'm going to put in an Amazon review about what's <laughs> wrong with it. But actually, it's not bad in certain respects. I mean, I'm going to rate it four stars out of five on Amazon. So okay. can, it's not a five-star book. So we can get a preview out of, uh, out of well, like for instance, one of the eight things that's wrong well, with it. You know, he, one of the things he does is he talks about, he's interested in things like taxonomies and how you go about organizing information. And one of the great things about the book is people are aware of the story of Engelbart and Licklider and whole American side. But there's some really good references. There was a guy at um, end of our bush, Nemex and all that. Well, it turns out there was a guy in Belgium uh, named Paul like Otlet or something like that who was, who was thinking about this stuff in the 30s. And there's some great diagrams in Alex's book, as an example. I wish you had shown some of those. That would get some of the people in the audience thinking. Now, he tried to implement it, and, 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 and it didn't quite work. But like he uses standard sort of um, taxonometric ontological things like Linnaeus's scheme for, for um, life, plants, animals, and so forth. Not a good thing because DNA is a little more complicated than that. But if he had done Mendeleev and did the chemical elements, those are much more discrete. So his book is focused on organizing the information, right? And, That's and, a big part of it, right? And and so I, so I was I was sticking to the communicating ideas part, which was which was. Different. So they were you have to do sorry. three things. Mm -hmm. You have to communicate, you have to do a degree of computing, and you have to do it in a reasonable time. If you don't do all three of the things, the, 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 the whole thing falls apart. And, uh, you know, we could talk about this for hours. Okay, but well, so, so I don't see how that's different than, than the rhetorical My point model, is which is that you have to not, and, and this, was, this was sort of the, so I'm going to cast this in terms of, of, the, of the ancient debate between the philosophers and the orators, right, which has been going on ever since. Right? Now I'm going to mention Plato. Right? So Plato had this, this feud with Isocrates. Right? And, and, and the feud was around, was it more important to seek the truth and know the truth? Or was it more important to be able to convince others of that which you knew, whether or not it was the ultimate truth, right? So, so oratory and rhetoric.
right? And rhetoric lost this battle by and large, right? So our, our tradition is on the philo of, of higher education is around the, the, the descendants of the philosophical argument. Say it's the search for the truth that's important, right? And the rhetorician said, if you know the truth but you can't convince anybody of it, then that's not effective. And therefore, you need to learn how to convey your arguments in such a way that you'll be able to move men in order to act upon your ideas, whatever they may be. And that has become known as mere rhetoric. Right? Rhetoric is always used following the word mere these days because, because we, the rhetoricians, lost to that argument. Now, the thing is, it's the two faces of Janus, right? It's, it's not that you want to convince people of stuff without any regard to whether or not it's the truth, or that you want to know the truth and you don't care if you take it to your grave. I mean, you'd want other people to find out about it too. So in fact, we're constantly trying to push both of those together. They both have to happen, right? And, and it's just throughout history, there's been this seesaw between which one do we feel you know, for this 400 years is more, you know, more important and more pressing and more deserving of attention. So, so I, I will agree with you completely. That is, to be able to write a program in a way that it is a, a model of clarity that everybody can read it and that they're emotionally moved by, by the beauty of the algorithm. That would be fabulous, but if it, if it didn't work on any known computer or it, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, oh, you know, n to the n type of an algorithm, then you might say, well, I don't know that it's terribly useful. But, but we do strive for both. It's just that we've been, f and because we are so young, right, it, it's, it's like the Sumerians, right? We've been focused on the commercial transaction. We've been focused on operating the machinery because we are just sort of slowly becoming aware that, that the, the other component, the rhetorical component, and that's the free software movement, right? The component that says, it's all about spreading the word. Th that, as the, that, that the balance tilts, perhaps, to the rhetorical side from the philosophical side. <laughs> Please do. Well, no, I, mean, I, I thought it was great, actually, that you had literate programming up there as an example. But it, didn't, it hasn't sold as well as those other books. Mm -hmm. Let me recommend to you mm -hmm. selected papers in computer science, mm -hmm. which includes a number of, there's actually four papers where he contrasts algorithmic, algorithmic thinking and mathematical thinking. And a big part of the problem that, that he has seen and, and of others is that we who are involved in computers, we do this iterative refinement thing. But a lot of society wants a direct solution. They want Pythagoras. They don't want an approximation to a quadratic. They want, give me this answer. And that's a big part of the problem our, our society has with us as a profession. Is, it, is, this, is this iterative algorithmic thing, which may not, you know, heuristics, the word heuristic in some fields is a really dirty word. And they say, don't get that in here. Oh, you know, I take your point, but, but I will, I, I continue to assert that there is no harm in figuring out how to be clearer about what it is that we're doing. That is, that is, we are operating the machinery. But people get emotional about changing their programming language. Right? People get emotional about suggesting that somebody ought to be able to read their program in French, right? that it ought to be localizable in French. And I've had people tell me, if I've selected my variable names in English, Right? then it's because they mean something. And that if, if you, were, you had some guy who didn't understand that nuance and would put in like the wrong kind of French localization, you, it would be harder to understand the program. Right? So, so, there, so somewhere in there is this notion that, that, that people need to understand programs. I believe that the free software movement is born out of that literate programming. Uh, you know, programs are, 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 are written for people to understand. And that's, and you know, Stallman was, was, you know, was, was at MIT during, you know, with Sussman in those days. So I, I think there's, there's, there's that similar worldview that Stallman translates into, um, since it's a communication thing, it's a speech thing, it's a freedom thing, right? What's the freedom if it's not human? 
I take your point. If it's all about operating machinery, what's the freedom involved? Machines don't have freedom. People have freedoms. So what are the people freedoms involved? And the people freedom is understanding how it works, being able to read the source. Right? He, he structures his argument around you need to have access to the source. Any of the other freedoms that sort of that he argues are derivative from that, I believe you, you, know, you can figure out a way to get around that. And in fact, a large part of the reason why people like free software or open source software is unrelated to the availability of the source. Right? It's less expensive than the other kind of software. Don't need the source for that. That's, that's sort of a, that's a, that's a, that's a pricing decision, right? So, you know, if you can get Visual Studio Express for free, it solves that problem, right? So it's not about the money. Okay, it's not about the money. Then what is it about, right? And at some level it becomes, well, I want to be able to understand what it does. I want to be able to read it. Well, if you're illiterate, then even if I give you the source code, you're not going to read it either, right? You're going to ask somebody else. And if it's not about the money, you can ask me, I'll tell you, because I've read it. And that's, that's, that's the priestly model. You want to know what's in the Bible? Ask me, I'll tell you. In fact, you risk your eternal soul. You, you, right? If you read it, a brilliant preface to William Tyndale's uh, uh, translation of the Bible, the first translation into, into, uh, into uh, the non-Latin, right? into, into the local language in English. Uh, and the, it's, you place your immortal soul at peril if you read and misunderstand, right? This is a dangerous thing to do. Ask a professional. Do not try this at home, right? Reading, reading is not for the faint of heart, right? You could get the wrong idea. And so the free software ideal is that people should have the freedom to read the source code because that will help with their understanding. And obfuscation defeats the purpose. Now there's on purpose obfuscation. And then there's, we just happen to use programming languages, tool sets, and a whole approach to the methodology that is more obfuscatory than what we could do. So that's obfuscation by failing you know, to act as opposed to obfuscation by acting. So, it, so, so I said, this, this whole chain went back. And it originally wasn't about literacy. It was about internationalization. Right? How, how do I write a program in Portuguese? I was getting on in years, and I was, you know, wanted to go back to my roots. I grew up in Brazil, so it was one of those. Oh, you know, I should, I should write a couple programs in Portuguese. That'll, that'll, that'll make me feel young. And, and I can't. I don't have that freedom, right? I, there's no. Turns you know, in Java, you actually can do Unicode. Python, you can't. And Perl, you can't. And there's a whole number of languages where you can't do that. So there are a few, right? C sharp and, and, and uh, uh, Java, you can actually have variable names in Unicode. Uh, the difficulty is, and I ran across this when I started trying to do this, is so you have a community of programmers in Spain. And not all of them speak English. Right? And so they want to hack on some open source thing. And they don't understand it. So what do they do? And what they do is they make a copy. They fork it. And then the stuff that they need to do, they translate those bits into Spanish. And then they work on it, write new code in Spanish. And then that never gets its way back into the tree because it's a four. It's like different, right? Because there's no framework around which you could localize it, which we have these frameworks, right? And we use them for the actual products. And we could use the same frameworks in the IDEs. And we could actually provide a way of preventing those forks. So focusing on the fact, so arguing that, well, if the code were executable right, and ran fast and was good, that that solves the problem, and it's OK to have forked it just to get it into Spanish, I think, I think misses, misses the objective of what, of what free software is trying to accomplish. It's trying to build community. Right? When, so you, when you go to free software conferences, open source conferences, there's a lot of talk about community, and building community, and that, and that the, communities, the communities build around programming languages, and the communities build around particular software projects. And, it, and it, it feels very much like bands of monks studying the sacred texts, right? And, and so we're, we're at that medieval stage. I, I firmly believe that we, you know, we're, we're in that 600 AD to 800 AD sort of roughly analogous period where you make all the same arguments. It's about the sacred text. 
right? It's about the saving of your, your eternal soul, right? There's no political issues here to be considered. Um, it's really hard to do, but that's okay because people don't have to do it. That's where we are. And we have a crusade going on, too. And, <laughs> 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 and we have a crusade. What's the crusade? Which crusade? Microsoft. <laughs> No, no, the one in the, the free Middle software East. crusade, or one in the Middle East. Oh, the one. Oh, Middle East. oh I, I see what you're, you're bringing, Paul. I thought we were talking about computer science. Uh, the example I should have brought up earlier is is uh, consider voting machines. Mm -hmm. If the software in the voting machines is open, then even though I can't read it, there are enough literate people in the community that will read it and sanity check it, and I can have confidence that it's going to work as compared to all of the... Right. So literacy is good, right? That somebody should read it is good, and, then, and then, then the next question is, that more people could read it, would that be better? Oh, I wasn't trying to say that, right. that it wasn't but, but right. So voting, voting machines, and we can sort of expand that into the future, that, there, that, that as, as more and more of what we do is related to digital assets, right? It, that law and property becomes, becomes uh, more like <coughs> fines, right? That, that, that they're digital and managed through software agents, right? It becomes more and more important in the conduct of one's daily life to be able to do something that will bear an astonishing resemblance to programming, as we understand it, right, in spirit. And to the extent that we can make that more accessible to people. But there are sins you can commit with software. For example, if I reprogram my car's computer, it would bit differently. And uh, that's surely a sin. Um, oh, just, so just because, just because everybody's literate doesn't mean everybody is a professional writer. Doesn't mean that there aren't some things that you're not, it, it doesn't mean that you should be able to spray paint whatever, you know, your, your writings, you know, wherever you'd like. Right? I mean, so, so, so there's still laws around literacy, right? Trying to separate out the, is this something that we want to make harder for people to do or we want to make easier for people to do? And, and, and particularly around free software, the harder it is to read the code and understand the code, the higher the barrier to entry is in terms of figuring out what's going on, the smaller the communities are, the more insulated the communities are, the less impact they're going to have on society. And so if we live in a world where it's all about um, operating the machinery and it's a bunch of specialists, it's like stonemasons or shipwrights, then, then that's not an unreasonable outcome. So I'm just trying to be an idealist. I know it's difficult because I work in large corporate IT shops. Um, and, and sort of think, yeah, and think I about- I wasn't saying it was yeah. bad. I was just pointing out that I can sin with software. Yes, you can. And uh, risk and, my moral and, soul, right? And 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 there, there are those who would who, you know who would argue that, that, that your choice of languages could be a sin. <laughs> are you doing? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.